All right. Welcome or welcome back, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Lincoln. I'm the community manager for the COVID-19 Cyber Threat Coalition. This is our weekly town hall where every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, we talk about uh, how security has changed in the age of COVID. Uh, normally, we have a guest speaker, but this week we're going to kind of uh, reflect on what the CCTC has done and kind of give a state of the union. So we're joined, of course, by Josh Sachs. Uh, we're also joined this week by Emily Austin, who heads up our uh, advisory team, and Nick Espinoza, who is in charge of media. So as with every week, uh, I will remind you that if you are not in our Slack group, to please join our Slack. Uh, if you are in Slack and you haven't gotten someone else to join, uh, do. Uh, you know, we, we're always looking to grow our community. We're always looking for more people to be engaged. Um, and last week I mentioned that we would like to get more direct involvement with IOC evaluation. Unfortunately, uh, our IOC bot is not ready for prime time, but we expect to next week have a way that everyone on this call, all 4,000, what, 4,044 members of our community, which is amazing, uh, can contribute just a little bit uh, when they have time to our IOC vetting process. And next week we'll have Pim Trurbach on to talk about that process and kind of talk about uh, how every person can give back just a little bit at a time. Um, so yeah, if you have found value in what we do, please spread the word on social media, uh, post it in work slacks, tell people to DM me, however we can get the word out uh, helps everybody. So. We will kick it off with uh, a recap of this week's advisory and some highlights. And without further ado, Emily, take it away. Hey, yeah, all right. Let me share my screen really quickly. Okay. Cool, can people see that? Cool. Um, so yeah, so hey everyone. Uh, we had a little bit of a lighter advisory post this week due to the holiday in the US, but we still have a couple things that I'd like to share. So as we've done in weeks past, um, we still looked at domain trends around COVID and new registrations still appear to be declining. So domain tools report seeing other domain themes like PPE and other types of supplies in registration data, but they've said that they're very low levels. This could indicate a bit of a shift to more targeted phishing though, as opposed to the massive amounts of COVID themed domain registrations we saw mid-March. So it could be a little bit more um, stealthy, a little bit more targeted. We'll keep following this and seeing what's happening. We'll also try to keep looking at um, some of the different uh, tokens that we've looked at before, some of the different phrases related that aren't COVID or coronavirus, but mask and other types of supply related terms. And then as far as the, the different stories we covered this week, um, one of the, this is one of my favorite stories. One of the amazing things we've seen during the pandemic is the way the security community has really come together to share resources and information to work toward a common goal, which is you know putting a stop to, or at least lessening the severity of COVID themed attacks. Microsoft announced earlier this month that they're open sourcing their COVID related threat intelligence. So they've made malware hashes and uh, phishing emails available via their Sentinel GitHub repo and the Graph Security API. And they're paying customers can get this data via a MISP feed as well. But it's really cool to see such a big organization take that step to make that freely available to people, um, at least through their Sentinel GitHub repo and the Graph Security API. So between this and uh, other existing feeds linked in our advisory and the CTC block list, there are tons of free data sources for helping detect malicious domains and malware and phishing and spam, all kinds of attacks related to COVID. So um, if you're curious about some of those other resources, definitely check out the post because some are linked there as well. So we often talk about 
remote access tools in our advisories and on these town halls. And today I want to highlight one that we haven't really talked about quite as much. So security firm TrustWave reported an increase in attacks against SSH servers, which they surmise is due to the work from home surge. And they're probably right. At the time of the rep their report, there were around 23 million SSH servers listed on Shodan. So they offer advice for securing SSH, which is reminiscent of advice we've offered for defending against COVID related threats in previous advisories. You know, keep your software up to date, only open ports or services you need, you know, practice good security hygiene. But they also offer some advice that's specific to SSH. So I'd encourage you to check out their post if that's a concern you have. Uh, and that's linked in our advisory as well. So for IT admins or anyone watching this that's in charge of any sort of servers that may have SSH enabled, uh, or I would encourage you to go check and see if you have public facing services uh, running SSH, and if so, follow TrustWave's recommendations. And finally, uh, this isn't really a story, but more of an announcement that I wanna make. If you are watching this, you are probably, hopefully, a member of our Slack group. And if so, I would encourage you to take a look in the announcements channel and look for the post about our survey. I posted about it just a little bit earlier today. And we'd like to learn more about how things have changed for you and your organization over the last month or so in regards to COVID-related attacks and other security concerns. What we're hoping to do is also learn and understand more about how we can best help you at this time. You know, whether it's different content or other resources, you know, we wanna understand what, what else we can provide and if what we're providing is helpful. So it's short, it's only 11 questions, and we don't collect any identifying information. We don't want to attribute the, the responses to you, but it will be really helpful for us in deciding kind of what we do next and how we, how we continue um, producing data and resources for the community. So we'll be sharing results in next week's advisory too, so that you can also kind of get a sense of what's going on in the community. Uh, and that's all I've got for this week. And uh, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we don't seem to have any questions from the audience, but I'll I'll reiterate. If you do, feel free to stick them in chat or in the Q and A as well. And uh, obviously, thank you, Emily. I'm not trying to step on Eric's toes, but it would also be, I think, really cool to get stories as well. You know, of of if anybody has used our block list successfully, you know, I think we'd love to hear about that as well because that's stuff that we can push out to the world. And I know the world loves to hear a, a happy story in the middle of a pandemic. So. So with that, please uh, please feel free to share, and we can even make it anonymous. It's not a problem. So with that, I'm, I apologize for interrupting, but Eric, please take it away. No, that's that's perfect. That's actually exactly what I was going to get at. Is um, yeah, the the more stories we have about uh, how you've used the advisory, how you've used our threat intelligence, helps us uh, improve it. So uh, please please do that. Um, yeah. yeah, so it, really quick, there's actually a question on the survey. There's two at the very end that ask, number one, is there anything we could be doing to help you more? And then two, just, is there anything else you want to tell us? So if, if there, if you have thoughts about that, or you want to share some of these anecdotes with us, that would be a great place to do it. Um, because we'll be reviewing all of that and looking through it. So there's your opportunity. There's the charge and there's the opportunity. So go forth, give us feedback, let us know how we can help. And we already have some feedback, all right. Uh, so Doc Gizmo says, I'm using Blocklist to help defend St. Francis, working Greek, G-R-E-A-K. Also been compiling a list of scammer emails and bad domains. And I think that's a really cool thing. Awesome. I mean, and we love to collaborate with hospitals. So uh, why don't you hit one of us up on Slack and we can, uh, you know, we can see what you're doing and maybe it, it's going to dovetail well with, uh, with us. So with that, Doc Gizmo, fan of that movie, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Um, great. So with that, I think that we will move on to Josh, who's going to give us a little bit of the uh, state of the union or state of the coalition, if you will. Great. Okay, let me share my screen. All right. Oh, that's frustrating. I want to be able to see Zoom at the same time. OK, here we go. Can you guys see my slides full screened? Yes. OK, cool. 
Okay, hi, I'm Josh. Um, I am a member of the steering committee here at CCTC. And today I'm gonna to be going over how, I guess I'll say I, how I, I think we're doing, um, since I'm just speaking for myself, but, uh, and hey, let's make this a conversation. So if the other panelists have thoughts uh, as I'm talking, definitely chime in. If people have comments, uh, definitely, definitely throw them in there too. Uh, so, so for those who've been on these calls before, you may have heard me talk about our mission. I'm going to reiterate it qu quickly for, for new folks here. Uh, our, our overall mission is to, is to use our cyber expertise to increase crisis resilience in society as a whole. So, um, you know, where we health, health experts, we'd probably be contributing in, in, uh, directly uh, to helping people who are suffering because of the pandemic, but because we are cyber professionals, we were seeking to bring people together to contribute indirectly by uh, helping organizations improve their cybersecurity. Uh, we wanna make sure that while medical institutions are dealing with the pandemic, they, they're not also dealing with successful cyber intrusions. We wanna make sure that as small businesses are feeling the pinch due to, the, due to lockdowns, uh, they are, aren't dealing with uh, cyber incidents in addition to all of, all of their potential financial troubles. Uh, that's, the, that's the way we're seeking to contribute. And we're, we're seeking to, to, to bring, bring together folks from every sector you can think of that's involved in cybersecurity, whether it's law enforcement and the, the government sector more, more generally, whether it's security product vendors or IT security part departments. Uh, we'd like to invite everybody to the party and, and we do have representation from all of those sectors. Some of the strategic um, uh, imperatives we're, 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 we're operating on are, uh, we'd like to increase social network density in the security community. Uh, so the security community is fairly tight-knit as it stands. Uh, it will probably exist in a, in a graph in which everybody can reach everybody else by way of uh, one or two hops. Uh, we'd like to increase the density of that network. And we're doing that by, by forming a Slack community that's easy to join. Uh, so we've created the Slack community and I, I believe we've facilitated a lot of densification of our community. It's easy to find, if you wanna find somebody who works for the FBI, you can just search our directory and find someone and get in touch with them. Uh, if you wanna find somebody who works at your particular security product vendor, you can uh, uh, contact from somebody from that vendor. Uh, I've, I've received lots of uh, support requests for Sophos products, <laughs> which is always interesting because I d almost never have the answer, but I, I, but I do redirect folks to um, people within my organization who can help. That's just an example. Uh, I'm sure lots of other folks who work for vendors have had a similar experience. Uh, a, a second strategic point that we're w working on is um, we, we'd, like to, we'd like to provide a set of resources that can be a kind of commons between different sectors of the cybersecurity community, like commons that include law enforcement, vendors, IT security departments, and others. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means later, but that, that involves standing up threat intelligence infrastructure that we all share uh, and can contribute to and also consume from uh, and other things as well. Uh, we're also focused on uh, where we have threat intelligence, force multiplying its outputs by, by getting uh, block list information that this volunteer community is producing into the hands of vendors, for example, um, into the hands of other open source projects within the security community, which I'll talk about uh, in, a few, in a few minutes. Uh, if we can get our block lists into the hands of a vendor, uh, all of a sudden we may, if that's a large vendor, we may be reaching tens of millions of endpoints uh, versus just a small community on our Slack that's consuming our block list. And uh, Josh, we've got a question for you real quick already Yeah. On what, yeah. on what you're talking about here. So anonymous attendee wants to know, how has the online threat landscape changed from the initial community emergency response to a more long-term managed response? And what are your predictions of emerging threats surrounding COVID? That's a really good segue. That's a great question. Um, but I think I'll defer to Emily on, on that one. I, I think I have less expertise than she does here. Yeah, yeah, so as far as kind of the the what's coming next part of it, I feel like I can I can speak to that, I think. Um, and again, this is all sort of uh, speculation on our part, informed speculation, if you will. Um, but, you know, what we've seen over the last month or so is really a decline in, um, in the, just kind of the massive, you know, domain registrations and all of the stuff. Like, w we've seen kind of a shift away from um, just the kind of wild activity we were seeing early on. It's tapered off. 
But what I think we're going to see, I think there's going to be kind of low and slow types of attacks. I think we're still going to have those. But I think we're going to see one of a couple of things, or maybe several of these things. So we're going to see a shift to different types of lures, which we've already kind of experienced with, you know, things around masks or other PPE or things like that. Um, but I also think we're going to see attackers moving through the attack pipeline they've set up. So like they've already sent all of their phishing campaigns. They've sent, you know, they've done their credential stuffing. They've, they've done what they're going to do. And now it's time to execute on what they've obtained. So I think in the coming months, we're going to see a little bit of a flavor change in the types of, uh, phishing and lures. But then I think also we're going to see, um, additional, like them moving through the attacks as well. And I am so sorry for my dog whining in the background. <laughs> totally um, he has feelings too. He's got thoughts about it. Um, so I hope that answered the question. I'm sorry. I was a little bit distracted there, but, but no, yeah. That was great. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. The much yeah. better answer than I could have given. I think it does. And we actually have another segue that I think, Josh, this one is going to be right up your alley. Uh, in that sense as well. And Robert wants to know, can you comment on how we can share our findings and get some further expertise and set of eyes on some of our spear phishing investigations? This is in regards to targeted emails to election officials in our state. And Robert, thank you for the question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I feel like we should probably follow up uh, outside of a public forum like this about that. Um, but I think there are folks uh, well, I, I know there are folks on our Slack who could uh, be useful uh, with respect to what you're, you've just yeah. mentioned. So and just, I, I, you can just message me um, or one of the one of the folks here uh, after after the uh, town hall, and we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely. Think, I think it really underscores though something that you said earlier, Josh, about how we have access. We're shrinking the cybersecurity community just by virtue of of the Slack channel because we have law yeah, enforcement people exactly. there. We have different vendors that might be able to, to look at that intelligence because we don't know the vendors that Robert is using here. So I think it's a, I think it's a great thing. So yeah, Robert, please send one of us a DM and we'll, we'll get you, we'll get you set up. And thank you for yeah, your Also uh, defending digital campaigns does work on this. Yeah. Uh, and that's which, what Aaron just, I guess mentioned. Aaron just mentioned <laughs> that as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Defendcampaigns.org. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, is site. another uh, opportunity. So yeah, great site. Between DMing somebody here or reaching out to them, you should be able to find uh, whatever it is that you need. Right on. Totally. Okay. Uh, looks like there may be another question. Oh, okay. No, it looks like we answered it. Okay. Cool. All right. Moving on, um, and yeah, feel free to interject at any point with the question. Um, we we like that. Okay, so uh, here's so uh, so in pursuing the strategy that I just laid out, uh, here are some things that we've accomplished so far. So we've, we've built up a Slack community with uh, over four thousand members, which is great. That's the, the Slack community is the, sort of the beating heart of of our organization. We've also built an Alien Vault community with with the help of the Alien Vault engineers. Uh, it has 692 members publishing thousands of, of indicators, which is great. Um, that's sort of the structured corollary to, to Slack uh, as far as threat sharing within our community goes. So the, the great thing about Alien Vault is, um, the Alien Vault Open Threat Exchange in particular, is that uh, information is exchanged uh, in computer readable format there. So um, Alien Vault supports lots of integrations. You can integrate the output um, using you know, a simple script uh, into your security infrastructure. Uh, we've also built um, built up these weekly town hall meetings, which have which have been great so far. Um, now, in terms of uh, the the direct kind of protection mission, we've we've uh, with the help of a do donation from Threat Connect, we've built up a, a SOAR platform for vetting indicators coming uh, out of our OTX platform. Uh, and so we've we've got this automated platform that can vet tens of thousands of indicators per day uh, and to eliminate false positives. Uh, that's what we use to to serve up our final block list, and we've got a web server st stood up uh, that uh, I think in the last month sixty thousand unique IPs have hit uh, that serve up block lists of malicious uh, malicious domains and malicious URLs. We also have um, some fairly large anonymous uh, vendor threat feed donations. So these are vendors who vendors who normally would sell threat intelligence 
have donated their threat intelligence to us and we're also serving that up as part of the same SOAR uh, threat intel pipeline and that, get, that populates our block list as well. And those, those block lists get updated automatically at 10 minute in increments. Uh, so, so we would advise folks who are pulling them down to pull them down at regular, regular intervals to get the latest threat intelligence. Uh, we've got a new piece of news as of today. Uh, uh, Quad9, I'm not sure how many folks know who, who they are, but they are a, um, a free uh, security community DNS with some, some big industry backers. Uh, uh, they're a secure DNS, so the idea is you look up a domain name and if it's, if it's known bad, uh, what you get sent to a different, you know, a, a, a safe IP and not the actual intended IP address uh, in the public DNS infrastructure. So our block list, uh, the plan is by the end of the week, we'll be populating uh, Quad 9's infrastructure which is great. It means that uh, if you decide to switch your DNS to quad nine, which is literally, the, 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 the name server is literally 9.9.9.9 .9 and IPv4, um, you'll, be, you'll get the advantage of all the threat intel that, the, um, that our coalition is, is producing. So those are, things we've, those are things we've accomplished thus far. Uh, we have a lot more we wanna do. Um, but there's also, there's also the reality of building a volunteer organization and um, the reality of, of which I speak is that is that when there's a, a crisis moment, uh, folks get really involved in CCTC, and when um, the feel, feeling of normalcy ensues, uh, l there's less involvement. So you can see this in the number in our Slack participation numbers. Uh, th these stats are from a few days ago. Um, we had 39, uh, 3,946 members. Um, that number has gone continuously up. Um, but the level of participation in our Slack actually peaked uh, around March 29th and has been going down ever since. Uh, for a while, it looked like we were sort of at steady states, uh, but now it's become clear there's this kind of downward trend. Um, and this is understandable. When you look at the a time series of COVID-19 deaths, uh, this is from Our World in Data. Many of you probably have seen this site before. Uh, our, our participation peaked right around the time that um, the rate of change in the in, in the deaths per 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 day um, was at its maximum. Um, as as the growth in 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 um, COVID nineteen deaths has has tape per day has tapered off, um, the level of participation has tapered off in our coalition. Uh, and I think that's just human nature. The people get more active in their nights and weekends uh, pitching in when there's more of a sense that, that we're living in a really exceptional time. And when, when normalcy ensues and people get burned out, that kind of thing, uh, you get less participation. Now that's, that's okay and that's to be expected and, and life probably won't proceed any other way. And we have kind of a way that we're thinking about that. Actually, let me skip ahead a couple of slides um, um, so I can kind of complete this thought. Um, you can, think of, you can think of our coalition during peak crisis as a campfire that's just burning full throttle. Sorry to mix metaphors there. <laughs> um, uh, and then you, can think, then you can think of our coalition during slower periods as uh, a campfire surrounded by a set of rocks and with the same sort of TP structure that you have in a normal campfire, except you just have kind of a bunch of embers, you know? Um, and um, let's say there's some new, new, new crisis that, that appears, which, it's not unlikely given the exceptional times that we're living through, like uh, the global uh, economy um, just starts sh shrinking at an incredibly rapid rate, more rapid than it's shrunk. And we're living in a, a really, um, a real state of exception around uh, the economic pain uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, you can imagine uh, a bunch of volunteers get involved and, and we're metaphorically uh, throwing a few more logs on the fire. Then we go back to this sort of high burn state. Um, and so the, 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 the way we're thinking about running this organization going forward is that we're kind of toggling between these two states, right? So that, that early, that early uh, mid-March state, right, was the sort of high burn state. And now I think we're probably going to go into a state where, you know, at some point we may reduce to like once every two weeks doing this town hall, for example. It might not be next week or the week after, but at some point that may happen. Um, and same, same thing with our, with our leadership structures, like our steering committee meetings and our, and our team meetings and that kind of thing. Um, but we want to be we want to be ready to um, take advantage of of um, of more volunteer enthusiasm when it comes when it comes our way as well. So along these lines, I'll, I want to talk about a few lessons lessons learned uh, in 
in uh, building CCTC over the last two and a half months, which is, is which is the period of time over which we've we've existed. Um, okay, so here are a few things. These are personal observations. I'm curious to hear what my what my colleagues here here think about these. I'd say. Hardcore project management is is hard on volunteer efforts. When we first started this effort, we set up like Jira and, and a bunch of detailed project tracking tools. Uh, people didn't really use those. Um, we found that we needed much much simpler project tracking tools to uh, to track our projects successfully. That was a lesson learned. We, we we spent a lot of time setting that stuff up um, and uh, found that it was just too detailed in a volunteer e effort uh, to justify it. Um, so we found a lot of success in keeping it simple. Um, another lesson learned it was that you, you, you really need a structure in place uh, to take advantage of lots of volunteer interest. I remember in the first few weeks of, of, of starting CCTC, I would get like scores of messages a day from people asking what they could do. And I didn't really know what they could do. It was total chaos. We didn't have a steering committee. We didn't have teams. We didn't, I didn't know um, who, um, who would be good in what role? Uh, we had people volunteer for roles and then and then leave because we were all just getting to know each other. And and some people had crises at work that um, that consumed their time. Um, we didn't have we had a, we had a lot of energy, but we didn't have the right kind of organizational machinery uh, in which to funnel that energy to sort of power the gears of the machine that we were working on setting up. Um, so. You know, that's just the chicken and the egg problem. Initially, you don't have a structure when you're starting an organization from scratch. I, I, I think a real um, win from these first two and a half months is that we now do have a structure. We've got a bunch of, of activists who um, all know each other, know how to work together, right? This group here and a bunch of other folks too who are on the steering committee or involved in the different teams. And so um, next time there's a surge of interest in volunteering, we'll be able to take advantage of that. Um, yeah, I think that's exactly right, Josh. Just to kind of interject on that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, is like even now, right, it, there are lots of people who don't know what they want to do, but would love to do something if we tell them what to do. Yeah, right? yeah. And I think that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that we still encourage people, right? Every week I'm on here telling people to please join us, please reach out, right? Because mm -hmm. now we finally do have that structure. Um, but it's definitely been been a challenge because, you know, yeah. everyone knows what their skill set are, uh, but they don't necessarily know what our needs are and where where those match up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I totally agree. Yeah, I, I, and I agree that this is still a challenge for us, knowing how, knowing, um, how to leverage the, the huge community that exists uh, on, on our Slack effectively. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so like some, uh, sorry, Nick, were you gonna say something? Uh, no, I mean, I, so there's a couple of questions from the audience and all that kind of stuff, but I, I, I just wanted to say, yeah, it's, it's been interesting to see just you know, how, how we've been able to basically build the house and then maintain it and get yeah. those processes in place. And, and Josh, I will give you an absolute ton of credit here, not just for founding the whole shebang bang but, but actually getting us you know, in line and getting that rolling. So it's just been very cool to see. Um, you know, and with that, I just, I just wanted to say um, real quick, uh, we have uh, Neil, uh, Neil Jenkins, our good friend from the Cyber Threat Alliance, uh, mentioned that defending digital campaigns is for cybersecurity of political campaigns. If the issue is with election officials, uh, check with the election infrastructure ISAC, uh, reach out to me via Slack channel, and I can help if you need it. So, so there it is. The Cyber Threat Alliance is actually willing to help you get to the ISAC. So, so I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, and also one more thing, Doc Gizmo, uh, just going back to Josh, what you were saying before, in terms of the death rate versus uh, involvement here. Um, Doc says, I hate to be morbid, but according to Inside Info, the newest phishing will be on the identity of COVID-19 deaths. And I think that's something that Emily's team has consistently been tracking, how the phishing mm -hmm. lures have been changing from just the, oh my God, where do I buy toilet paper? And what does the CDC say to, you know, everything else that as this pandemic has evolved. So, so heads yeah. up, that, that might be something that you might see in a future advisory from em Emily's team, you know, in that sense. Right. And with that, please continue on. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, 
thanks to everybody. Um, so here are some things that I think have, have worked. Um, so we, we have a really simple organizational s structure here. We don't, we don't have a lot of, we, I think we've minimized unnecessary process around decision making. Uh, it's a very friendly group of people who are trustworthy um, and that, that affords that. Um, but just a, a general uh, heuristic of trying to keep things as, as simple as possible um, has worked well. So we've got a steering committee, we've got a bunch of team leads, and then we've got team members, and we've got a simple vetting process to make sure people are who they say they are, and then people can get involved in our teams. Um, I'm going a little bit out of order here, but I think, I think part and parcel of that has, has been we've picked uh, activities that optimize for uh, they are um, helpful uh, it, as far as protecting people go, and, and they're easy to paralyze. Uh, they don't require a huge coordination overhead. So um, I de definitely disagree if, if, if you disagree, Emily, but I would say like the Threat Advisory is a good example of that. You guys have um, different author authors writing different sections that all sort of address what's going on in the threat landscape, but it doesn't, be, we don't have to, it's not like building some sort of Rube Goldberg software machine, right? Where it's like you need, you know, intense architecture meetings. It's like, you know, it's like a paral paralyzable task where you've got folks writing subsections um, and they don't have to coordinate all that much, which is health, health, healthy for a volunteer effort. Um, delivering threat intelligence is also uh, not that hard to parallelize, right? Lots of people can contribute IOCs based on different points of observation on the internet, and we run them through a common uh, FP vetting pipeline, um, and, and then we publish them to, um, to the folks who, who use them. Um, so, we, so I think p picking tasks like that has been, has been was a win for this coalition. Uh, we, we picked a few activities like running this town hall, publishing IOCs, um, and publishing the, 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 the advisory um, that have been, um, uh, haven't been uh, too much of a burden to coordinate and have allowed, allowed us to grow and do something meaningful. Uh, we, made, we made our Slack really low friction to join. Um, we have a simple vetting process and we recruited a really good group of team leads who've done a great job at herding cats. So those are all, those are all uh, wins, I would say. Um, and I already showed this slide, but this is sort of how we're thinking about the, uh, the longevity of this group. Uh, we're not expecting just steady monotonic growth, but rather um, uh, something that's more bursty, um, but to just build up um, the coalition over time um, as uh, this uncertain period and, and very painful period in, in history proceeds. So. I'll leave it at that. Uh, hopefully I've piqued some folks' interest in, in what we're doing. And, um, and we are definitely always looking for more help and more volunteers. You can contact anyone who's uh, on this panel uh, on Slack for more information about how you, how you might get involved. Yeah. And we, we actually do have a comment from the audience here, um, you know, in that sense. Uh, so Eileen said, I think also future phishing, we use contact tracing lures. Example, based on contact tracking, you've been exposed, click here, malicious link, or attachment to see details. I think, Eileen, you're 100% right. I mean, just what do hackers do? They prey on human nature. If it's Christmas time, we all get fake Christmas cards. I mean, that's the name of the game. But I have no doubt that Emily's team will be, will be tracking that in real time, <laughs> as we've seen over the weeks. So all good. And with that, Eric, please take it away. No, that, perfect. Um, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, that was really, really enlightening um, to me, and I've heard most of it. Um, so I, I really appreciate uh, going over it again. I hope it was helpful to all of you on the call watching us. Um, I don't think we have any more outstanding questions. Uh, so again, I will reiterate that even as things get back to uh, as, <laughs> how do I phrase this? Even as we learn how to work under the circumstances we have been forced into, uh, please continue volunteering, continue reaching out to us, continue speaking to us. Um, if you are not a vetted volunteer, and you are still in the public channels and you would like to be a vetted volunteer who can uh, contribute more and interact in our vetted channels, please reach out to us for that as well. Um, we, we would love to have every single person 
uh, on this call and people who aren't even on this call contribute more. Uh, please make sure that if you are here today, try to be here next week where we're going to talk about our IOC bot. Um, and uh, again, if you know someone who might want to be involved but isn't in our Slack yet, please promote us. Uh, share that link. Is it this link? This link. Share this link. Uh, you know, we're always happy to talk to people. We're always happy to collaborate with people. Um, and I really appreciate everybody taking the time to join us today and ask all of those really helpful, thoughtful, and insightful questions. Um, so with that, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you everyone for watching. And uh, I'll see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.